Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the fourth and final debate of the 2021 China Power Conference. I'm Bonnie Lin, Director of the China Power Project and Senior Fellow for Asian Security at CSIS. Thank you for joining us today. Our debate topic today focuses on China's influence in the Indo-Pacific. China is increasingly utilizing its growing power to shape developments along its periphery. As China's economy has grown, countries in the Indo-Pacific have become more economically reliant on China. China has been willing to coerce countries through targeted economic and trade actions. China's economic ties in the region are also poised to deepen as a result of China's inclusion in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, one of the world's largest free trade agreements. In addition to its growing economic influence, the Chinese military continues to modernize at a rapid pace. China has increasingly asserted its interest in the region against many of its neighbors. This April, for example, China amended its maritime laws to include additional requirements on foreign ships entering what it calls seas under the jurisdiction of China. The recent DOD China Military Power Report assesses that if China realizes its modernization goals by 2027, China may have more credible military options in a Taiwan contingency. Given growing Chinese power and how assertive China has been, this has raised many questions within DC and elsewhere on Beijing's intentions and goals for the Indo-Pacific. Among them is a key topic of debate, which is, does China seek a sphere of influence in the region? And what would a Chinese sphere of influence involve? This is a hotly debated topic, and not surprisingly, Chinese officials have repeatedly emphasized that China is not seeking a sphere in the influ uh, influence in the region, and is instead seeking to foster stability and economic growth in the Indo-Pacific. So our debate today is on this topic, but we want to focus not on what China seeks to do, but actually what is possible for China. So our debate proposition is, given China's growing power, China will have a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific by 2027. So before we go to our two very esteemed debaters, I want you to take a moment to cast your votes either for or against this proposition. So I'm now enabling the poll and you should be able to see it on your screen in a second. I will, give, I will pause here for about 30 seconds uh, to give folks an opportunity to vote. And then I will uh, introduce the speakers while we give you more time to vote. So we are incredibly fortunate today to have two leading experts as well as practitioners on this topic joining us today. So arguing for the proposition is Dr. Graham Allison, the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government at Harvard University. Dr. Allison is a leading analyst of national security with special interests in nuclear weapons, Russia, China, and decision-making. Dr. Allison was the founding Dean of Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, and until 2027, served as its director as a director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, which is ranked the number one university affiliated think tank in the world. As Assistant Secretary of Defense in the first Clinton administration, Dr. Allison received the Defense Department's highest civilian award, the Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service, for shaping relations with Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, to reduce the former Soviet, uh, Soviet nuclear arsenal. We're also delighted to have us today argue against the proposition, the Honorable David Stilwell, former Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs at the US Department of State. General Stilwell is a seasoned leader in the foreign policy world, serving not only as the Assistant Secretary for East Asia and Pacific Affairs between 2019 and 2021, but also as the Asia Advisor to the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff during his time in the Air Force. General Stilwell was a member of the Air Force for 35 years and served multiple tours in Korea and Japan as a linguist, a fighter pilot, and a commander. He enlisted in 1980 and retired in 2015 with the rank of Brigadier General. During his time, he served as a defense attache in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing from 2011 to 2013, 
and directed the China Strategic Focus Group at U.S. Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii from 2017 to 2019. Thanks to both Graham and Dave for joining us today. So before we begin debate, let me share the results of our live poll. So our polling results show that about 78% of the participants agree with the proposition uh, that China will have a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific by 2027. 22% disagree with this. So now let's share the polling results from our Twitter poll, which we've been uh, conducting the last couple of days. The Twitter poll shows a slightly different result, but, but that might be partially explained by the question that we asked was slightly different. So the proposition for the Twitter poll is China will establish a sphere of influence in the Indo Pacific by 2027. And this poll shows that the results are relatively even, 50-50. 50% agree and 50% disagree. So with that, um, let me now turn the floor uh, to Graham for his opening uh, comments. Uh, he'll have 15 minutes, followed by uh, Dave. So Graham, over to you. Thank you again. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be part of a panel uh, at CSIS with David, uh, whom I know and respect over many, many years, and with Bonnie, who <laughs> I've known since you were a student and admired your work. I also applaud the effort CSS, CSIS has made to uh, put a spotlight on the dramatic rise of China's power and your excellent graphics on this, and to try to promote discussion and debate about the implications of this. And so that's why I was happy to be asked to participate today. Now, as to the proposition, which I think is not really the best focus, I think the proposition is a bit awkward. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it un unfortunately risks taking us down some semantic uh, rabbit hole uh, uh, and off the target. So but in any case, I'll address the issue we have, and then I'll say uh, a few thoughts about where else I would hope we can take the conversation. So basically, sphere of influence is one of the core concepts in international relations, as all of us who are IR analysts understand. The term was actually initially used, the sphere of influence as a, as a term in the 19th century, but the concept is as old as Thucydides when the Spartans tried to prevent the Athenians from rebuilding the walls around Athens after the joint effort of the two had defeated the Persians. So anybody who's a student of international relations and who doesn't understand that spheres of influence are one of the fundamental concepts probably doesn't deserve to be in your, in your uh, audience. We take a slide here, please, if you can do me, Anna. So basically, Hans Morgenthau is the, I think, teacher or dean of international relations for most of us. And as he says, it's obvious from political history of the human race that balance of power is one concept and the concomitant spheres of influence are the very essence of international politics. So what, what do we mean when we say sphere of influence? And I would say we mean what the dictionary says it means. If we do the next slide, which is the uh, Oxford English Dictionary definition. So a sphere of influence is a arena or area in which a country that has power exercises it uh, to persuade another country to behave differently than it would have, have behaved otherwise. So it's an area in which another country has the power to affect developments through it, though it has no formal authority. Okay? So if that's the definition of sphere of influence, then the proposition that will China uh, by 2027, have a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific, I, I think the argument, the answer is too obvious. <laughs> it's hard to belabor. Now, I, I would suggest as we think about it, just ask, your, ask ourselves three questions. First, 
already? Doesn't China have a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific today? That is an area in which it's using its power to shape and change behaviors of other countries that would be otherwise, did it not have a sphere of influence? Secondly, given the projections of uh, China's economic, political, military growth, will it have an enlarged sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific by 2027, the anniversary of the, the 100th anniversary of the PLA? And again, I think the answer seems to me obvious. So thirdly, if Trump and Biden are correct, and I believe they are, or were correct in defining China as a great power competitor, what, is that, what does that mean? What the definition of a great power competitor, doesn't that mean that just by definition, it has the power to, and will exercise that power to influence the behavior of other governments, and in the Chinese case, in the Indo-Pacific. So as I look at it, I think the answer is yes, yes, and yes. So China has a sphere of influence today. It's almost impossible to make the argument to the contrary, but I'll be interested uh, in, in what David says about it. Uh, by 2027, will that sphere of influence likely be enlarged? I believe the answer is yes. And when we talk about China as a great power competitor, are we per se recognizing that it has great power and that it'll exercise that power to advance its interests and values and is doing so? And again, I think the answer is yes. So where to go from here? And I think, I hope in the discussion, we can focus on the more important question is given that China has a sphere of influence today and is expanding that sphere of influence, what can the US and our allies and partners do to try to maintain a favorable balance of power or correlation of forces in order to protect our interests and values? Uh, that's beyond the scope of the, the point, the proposition stated, but I hope in the conversation we can go there. So let me uh, try to support this proposition by simply asking or, or making us or asking us to think, does China have a sphere of influence today in the military realm? Well, what would the commander of PACOM say? Does it have a economic sphere of interest in the Indo-Pacific? What would Li Kuan Yew say? Is it going to have an expanded sphere of influence in this region? Again, what is PACOM planning on? What did Li Kuan Yew anticipate? And finally, if this is a new realm of great power competition, as Jim Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense, whom both David and I greatly admire said, what does that mean in terms of China's ability and will to act and use its power to affect the behavior of other nations uh, in the Indo-Pacific? So for those of us in the unclassified community, we had a rare window into the classified discussions when Admiral Davidson, the commander of, of Indo-Pacific, testified in March for the Senate Armed Services Committee and somehow his slides uh, leaked. So if we take the first slide, please. So uh, here is the slide that leaked from March uh, of this year, uh, testimony by Admiral Davidson, in which as you'll notice in the brown area, he calls this a area of PLA influence. Uh, area and sphere are synonyms. 
So what this chart shows is that in the period after 1996, when uh, I was in the Pentagon when China tried to coerce Taiwan and the US brought up carriers and forced it to back down, China began a building program, which even by 1999 had a, given it a much bigger footprint of influence in the adjacent waters. So that's 1999. Now, what about today? This was Admiral Davidson's second slide. If we take the next slide. So again, according to Davidson, slide, uh, China's military sphere of influence or an anti-access area denial capability has now expanded in this instance, almost to the second island chain. So first island chain, think uh, inside of that Taiwan uh, out to Okinawa, second island chain, all the way to Guam. So these are areas in which having deployed uh, D-21 uh, uh, so-called carrier killer missiles, China is able to threaten American military forces if they attempt to operate in this area. And finally, his third slide, if we take the next one, projects to 2025. That's not quite 2027, but it's close enough. And you can see that on the current trajectory, China's military sphere of influence, that is arena in which it can deny the US the ability to operate without great risk of being sunk uh, is expanded. So just to conclude my take on the expansion of the military sphere of influence. China has, since 1996, built up military capabilities that impact the US and our operations. And as Admiral Davidson reportedly testified in the classified session, but which was making the statement that former Vice Chairman Winnefell and former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work have also commented on. Today, when the US plans for scenarios in the peripheral seas around China, the carriers remain outside the first island chain, almost a thousand miles away beyond the reach of the D-26s, which therefore means they are basically beyond the reach of the battle, if it should be a battle over Taiwan. So military sphere of influence, yes. What about in the economic realm? If we take the next slide. So this is a slide I made as part of our great rivalry report. And it's hard for most Americans to remember that while in the year 2000, the US was the major trading partner of everybody. In 2020, China is the overwhelming trading partner of every major uh, Asian economy. So twice as much trade with South Korea as the US does. A time and a half or uh, as big trade as Japan way, way, way bigger than the US with Australia. So what? So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we look, remember the incident in which the Japanese captured a fishing boat that was a Chinese fishing boat in, in, in Japanese waters and held the captain, China cut off all the exports of rare earth minerals to, China, to Japan. That, that was about 97% of their imports. And to no one's surprise, Japan quickly released the captain. Or if we want a more recent and relevant example, think about South Korea. 
and missile defenses. In 2016, when South Korea angered China by announcing the decision to participate in the US-led Terminal High Area Defense Area, THAAD, uh, by punishing and ultimately basically destroying the Chinese operations of a major South Korean uh, retail conglomerate, Latte. What did, how was that ultimately resolved? And it was resolved in October of 2017 when South Korea announced what they called three no's. No additional THAAD batteries, no participation in the US regional military defense system and no trilateral alliance with the US and Japan. So again, back to our proposition, is this a demonstration of China's use of its economic power to change the behavior of other nations in the Indo-Pacific? And I think obviously it is. Finally, I just remind you of Lee Kuan Yew about who was my, basically my tutor. Uh, fortunately, I had a good fortune to be uh, a student of his in effect for many years to try to understand more about China and China's expanding influence. And as he said, Chinese always say, oh no, we don't have a sphere of influence. We're, 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 we're not a hegemon. Uh, uh, all powers are equal, uh, big and small. But Lee Kuan Yew said, when we do something they don't like, they say to us, know your place. There are 1.4 billion Chinese. Think about how many people you have, know your place. So as Lee Kuan Yew said, the anticipation of that already significantly shapes the behavior of other states for their fear of coercion. And thus they pay a degree of deference to China. And that's exactly what happens when you're within somebody else's sphere of influence. So finally, uh, Secretary Mattis in 2018 uh, issued what he thought of as a, in effect, a, a wake up call or an announcement of the end of primacy. So if we take the next slide. So this is the 2018 National Defense Strategy. And as he says, uh, the primacy which people cherished and which many people have got so deeply embedded in their heads that they can't recognize the world we're facing today, uh, misses the fact that there's been, as he says, a major shift in the global security environment one in which we now have to recognize China as a great power competitor. So he contrasted this with the before and after, which is then essentially the consequence of China's establishment of a sphere of military uh, influence in the Indo-Pacific. Before, he says, the US has enjoyed uncontested or dominant superiority in every operating domain. We could deploy our forces when we wanted, assemble them where we wanted, and operate it how we wanted. That was then. Today and going forward, as he says, every domain is contested. Air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace. So China's buildup of its military capabilities has increased its ability to contest US activities. And the consequence of that has been to change the costs and the risks and actually the plans for our operation. So just to conclude, uh, does China have a sphere of influence, economic and military in the Indo-Pacific today? Yes. Will it have an enlarged sphere of influence in 2027? Yes, almost certainly. And the question of whether and how the US can work with allies and aligned to contest that and to sustain 
a correlation of forces to which China will have to adapt is the question I think we should focus on going forward. Thank you, Professor Allison. Thank you for the very in-depth uh, discussion, as well as the very clear definition of what a sphere of influence is. So let me now turn to General Stilwell to offer your views on this topic, including if you agree with this and if you're using the same definition of sphere of influence. So Dave, over to you. Well, thank you. Um, I, to your first question, uh, it's the same definition, but I, I look at it more broadly. Uh, rather than focusing purely on military and economic, I look at the, the overall or comprehensive, as Xi Jinping would say. And here's my slide. It's, a, it's an excellent book on um, how this phenomenon works and how we need to get out of this mode of comparing bullets and rivets and, and those things and look at the overall picture that includes its ability to uh, influence hearts and minds and reputation, uh, reputational cost and, and the rest. So uh, my position is that the Chinese influence in the region will be greatly diminished by 2027. And I'm gonna to point to trends that began in 2010 uh, and continue today. In short, we have achieved and we've seen peak China. That's my position. So for 25 years, I was a fighter pilot, as you can see from my decorations in my, my room here. And I was convinced that really the only way to change behavior of another country was through force. You would coerce them through threat or use of force. And not having seen diplomacy in action, I didn't understand diplomats or the State Department or how diplomacy works or, or, or its utility. Uh, upon arriving in the embassy in Beijing in 2011, uh, I was forced with the uh, opportunity uh, to consider how diplomacy works, even military diplomacy. And granted, I wasn't that effective and granted uh, it's difficult um, military diplomacy. We were more effective in other areas. But people like Bob Wong and Ryan Haas and other very good friends that I met while I was there uh, kind of guided me into the light on this. And so I began to think about what other means there are of changing people's behavior. Uh, and in, in this case, the PRC. We're fast forward to 2019, I'm at the State Department and um, I don't have bullets and bombs anymore to force people to change their behavior. I only have whiskey and words as a diplomat. Um, and the conclusion I came to is, although it's a much slower process and more difficult process, it has more lasting effects because what diplomacy does is convinces people of your position, creating long-term effect. Look at the 70 years of NATO and uh, our alliances in the Indo-Pacific and the rest. Uh, we don't force alliances, the people join in because they share our ideals and, and our, our thoughts. Um, the compelling part, so you can either coerce people or you can convince them. And in my mind, uh, the coercion is a very short term uh, process. And this is what China has been using, as Dr. Allison rightly pointed out, using economic uh, and military coercion uh, over time. But what we are seeing now, uh, you know, as we uh, watch peak China is more and more uh, countries, people, others are willing to stand up uh, and resist uh, this Chinese uh, coercive power. It's not to say that they don't have the ability to convince, uh, but that ability is waning as we've seen a, a series of uh, empty promises uh, broken, none more egregious than the uh, walking away from the joint declaration uh, related to Hong Kong uh, that they did uh, in 2020. And so Will, have they, will they have a sphere of influence? They will have a sphere of influence in 2027, but it's gonna be significantly diminished. Um, after 20 years of endless empty promises, uh, Beijing's ability to exert influence versus compelling acquiescence has waned considerably and will continue to do so. The trends are almost all negative. I'm gonna run through some headlines here. Uh, a major factor in Beijing's failure to, is their failure to follow through on their commitments which has eroded the credibility and legitimacy of what they claim to be a better form of government uh, because it calls commitments and treaties mere scraps of paper. The most egregious example, as I mentioned, was uh, Hong Kong, uh, which is continuing to affect them as the Olympics come up, by the way. And this short-sighted decision has significant knock-on effects to start with uh, in Taiwan uh, and the um, pretty much elimination of the Kuomintang, the KMT, as a political factor. They're having to uh, re rebuild. Uh, Beijing's loss of political, diplomatic, and economic influence is attributable to its failure to recognize the importance of preserving its credibility uh, and trust by making its words and its actions align. Um, this newly aggressive China uh, has definitely eroded China's brand, which will have impact on its ability 
uh, and influence going forward. So the first step uh, in solving any problem is to recognize there is a problem. And for the longest time, we have uh, denied that. Uh, I, again, uh, am taking heart in, as I watch the headlines and, and poll data go that um, China's comprehensive power is being diminished. And we can talk about economics and military. Those are areas that are going to require more work. But again, as you look at broad political power and political warfare, their ability to affect others uh, through their influence uh, is definitely not what it was five years ago or 10 years ago. So here are some headlines. Pew poll, 78% of people from 14 countries surveyed have negative or very negative impressions of Xi Jinping. And nobody likes cult of personality. Another headline, UK blacklists dozens of Chinese biotech firms that aid the military. 10 years ago in the embassy or, or five years ago with the joint staff, this was unthinkable that we would actually take these steps and others are following suit. Uh, here's another one, Harvard professor goes on trial on charges of lying about his ties with China. This is Dr. Charles Lieber. Um, another headline, hackers backed by China are exploiting a major security flaw. Xi Jinping's leadership style, Colin, micromanager that leaves underlings scrambling. People are actually talking in Beijing. Communist Party members are actually talking because they are frustrated with how things have gone and how um, you know, Xi Jinping has probably uh, overstepped. Uh, Lithuanian diplomats leave China after Beijing downgrades the embassy. Lithuania is a country of 3 million people. And this reflects Xiang Jiechi's attitude that you're all, you know, China's a great, a big country and you're all small countries and that's just the way it is. Believe me, that does not give you positive um, convincing power or influence in, in any country, um, especially in the Indo-Pacific. And finally, um, U.S. public turns against the Chinese Communist Party in the worst poll savaging uh, since last year. Here's two funny ones. Um, the call for China cadres to have three kids sparks outrage. If you've been watching the demographic problem that they've created is, is really starting to come to uh, uh, call. And so going, they've gone from one child policy to three child policy, and they have directed all Communist Party members, 90 million, to have three children uh, under uh, pain of um, uh, punishment. And then there was one this morning that I didn't get, basically mandates vaccine or uh, it eliminates opportunities for vasectomies for men. So again, these are things that affect China's brand, not just in China, but outside. Uh, influence comes in many forms. It's no longer um, just a Cold War geographic or military, you know, spheres of influence issue like we saw with the Warsaw Pact uh, and others. Uh, and again, going back to other forms of influence, social uh, information is a big one. Uh, we've been losing that fight for a long time. People are starting to wake up uh, in our internet and social media. Um, Another issue, and then and Dr. Allison rightly pointed out, is it's not the U.S. versus China. They've tried to make these contests bilateral, but as we know, um, it's the like-minded allies and partners, things like the Quad and AUKUS and others. Um, uh, Beijing has no counter to that. So whether it's in the military, economic, or other spheres, it's very difficult for uh, the Beijing um, to respond because who do they can who can they fall back on? We, we, you mentioned China, Russia. That's a possibility, uh, again, one worth discussing. Interesting and encouraging for me that both the EU and NATO have become interested in, in this. And so the spheres of influence can be um, uh, responded to with, again, as you mentioned, balancing of power. And, and getting Europe and NATO involved uh, has been uh, a very positive development. We've seen the US, um, Germany, France, Canada, others, actively deploying in the military space to uh, the South China Sea and elsewhere in the region to make known that uh, we have op options as well in terms of balancing power. The China EU summit has been delayed indefinitely. Again, the conditions are not right, uh, they're noting. And on a personal note, I was invited to Rome three weeks ago to talk to the, Na the Native Defense College on exactly this topic, and so uh, along with others. And so they're paying attention and, and that's encouraging also. It's not just the region, it's more global. Japan has been, uh, again, a very positive outcome here as they make very explicit commitments to the defense of Taiwan. This began in 2010, as Dr. Allison noted with the Chinese uh, fishing uh, trawler ramming a Japanese Coast Guard boat. And the result may have been a short-term acquiescence due to the rare earth issue, but the long-term uh, result was Prime Minister Abe Shinzo the, the DPJ only lasted about a year and a half. And after the 2010 event, that government fell and a powerful LDP returned. And this is 
get we, what we see. This is the result of this sort of heavy handed uh, approach. And it does have effect on China's spheres of influence. India has come on very strong, both by itself and as part of the Quad. Um, and so even though hard power is increasing, it's being checked geographically with allies and partners. Uh, the Gwadar port project, it's still Indo-Pacific, uh, as you have seen in, lately in the news, is not going very well. There's active protest because the promises uh, have proven empty and there's been no benefit. In fact, it's been uh, mostly to uh, Pakistan's detriment. Um, so more broadly, China's non-military influence uh, is premised on a single factor for, for me, is credibility. You can't promise everything and give nothing. Uh, you know, my formulation there is if you take words and you multiply it by deeds, words and then actions, the result is, is trust or credibility. And Beijing has played this middle power approach for the longest time uh, and has been given short shrift to following through on its commitments. I mentioned Hong Kong non-militarization of the South China Sea, I mean, almost every day. I mean, how many times have you seen the People's Daily or Xinhua say, have Xi Jinping saying, China will continue to reform and open its markets uh, to the greater world while doing the opposite? This has gotten a lot of the economic uh, sphere interested, although there's a lot of work left to do. Uh, our businesses and sadly, not so much our financial world but is starting to take notice and it's gonna be more difficult for them to continue down that path. So, um, the peak China is inevitable after the world finally acknowledged that these are empty promises and that you cannot put stock in what China says. And therefore, you need a verification regime. If you remember in May of 2019, uh, Liu He came back to Beijing with an agreement and then tore it up because, because the US side insisted on a verification regime. China was going to sign it and then not follow through. We're seeing this with the current, um, uh, you know, the tariff issues, the, the agreed on uh, frame, the framework that was agreed on during the Trump administration. Uh, I think Beijing has followed through on about 60%, which is gonna mean even harder uh, um, position of the US and, and US trade. If you watch Beijing's response to the Summit for Democracy, it was shrill because they saw that this is their weak point. This is where they're vulnerable. They claim that this new type of authoritarianism uh, is good and, and positive and, and you know, is, uh, applicable outside of its borders. And uh, the Summit for Democracy you know, proved otherwise. Uh, this again, affects their ability to pro project influence, not just in the region, but in the world. Um, look in the informational and cultural space. I mean, this matters. Um, social media matters. It changes the ways people think, vote, act. Um, the World Tennis Association and the detention of Peng, uh, Peng Shui has got a lot of people up in arms. You would have thought that the NBA would have taken a similar approach when Daryl Morey uh, and, and uh, made his tweet supporting the, the people of Taiwan, I mean, of Hong Kong. Sadly, it didn't, but the WTA example is a positive one and we hope that the NBA, the NFL and others will follow suit. Um, the business interests are great, but you still have a reputation to maintain and you still have to stand up for uh, who you are uh, as in the free world. The genocide determination, another major hit and, uh, after the US made that determination, but while I was in the State Department, um, we have recently a, an independent tribunal came to the same conclusion. You can deny access to the Xinjiang area, but people are going to find out. And you know, information is like water, it leaks. The Olympic boycott, yes, it's diplomatic, but it has impact. And you, so you can tell from Beijing's response, it's uh, important. We have yet to hear about the Michaels. This is another uh, example of um, Beijing hard power uh, and, and losing in the influence uh, uh, space. You know, uh, the Huawei heiress, uh, Meng, it was detained in, China, in Canada and the PRC wasn't even apologetic about saying they took two uh, hostages in, Can in China uh, and held them until to exert pressure, not influence, but pressure on Canada to change its course. We heard from Hmong, we have not heard from the Michaels, and I think this, uh, we, we need to hear from them because it's important to, to, to show how they were treated com to, compared to how Hmong was treated. It will change people's approach to this Chinese influence. Uh, success, the Belt and Road Forum, the BARF. Uh, BARF won, the, the attitude was the Belt and Road, one belt, one road is China's gift to the world. Interestingly, after having experienced it, BARF 2 message was one belt, one road isn't so bad. And these are all positive indicators. And I think the trends uh, are going in the right direction. Um, 
In geopolitical politics, uh, that's a little more difficult, but the effects are there. Me Mekong Water Conference basically showing that uh, the Mekong downstream countries need that water and China's gonna have to, to play ball. Another one is uh, the ASEAN for um, claimants in the South China Sea. As you saw, the US changed, well, 2016, uh, UNCLOS ruled in the Philippine, Philippines' favor. A small country took on a large country, ruled in their favor that China's claims were illegal and its actions were illegal. The US changed its policy to match uh, last year in July. And so US policy also denies China's uh, unlawful maritime claims uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, and the region has begun to echo that, pick up on that. And finally, demographics. Um, this is part of China's influence, sometimes for better or worse. But as I mentioned, um, one third of the Chinese population is, uh, is, is old, is over 60. This is not a positive thing. This is a negative thing. If you've gone to a restaurant in, in Beijing, what you'll see is a table of seven, one child, generally male, two parents, and then two grandparents on each side. That's great for the kid because he's getting lots of attention and food. But in 20 years, that kid's going to have to support six people. That is not a sustainable uh, demographic. And without the ability to uh, draw people through influence uh, in, in terms of um, immigration, uh, this is going to be a very difficult uh, problem for them to solve. So finally, um, to have staying power and to maintain their spheres of influence, great powers need buy-in and they need willing cooperation, not coercion. Coercion is temporary. Uh, the Soviet Union had to exhort force to maintain its Warsaw Pact uh, uh, sphere. Beijing should have continued its hide and bide policy and made gradual uh, changes. But for some reason, Xi Jinping is in a hurry and he's uh, basically abandoned hide and bide, uh, which is, in, is creating these problems. As we saw with the Soviet Union, this use of compellence can create short-term acquiescence, but to have staying power, sustainable spheres of influence require Beijing to move from coercing to convincing. And it's clear even small countries are no longer convinced. Thank you. General Stoll, thank you. Uh, a very different perspective in terms of whether China has um, the ability to have a sphere of influence, particularly as you argue uh, China's power might be declining from between now and 2027. So let me now turn the floor back to uh, Professor Allison. So Graham, over to you for your initial five minute rebuttal. So thank you very much, David. I thought an uh, excellent uh, presentation and we're gonna quit calling you general and call you ambassador. So I, I like the discovery of diplomacy and uh, the uh, focus on it. I think that's a helpful reminder. I think you also rightly remind us that China is not 10 feet tall. China has many weaknesses uh, and that China's recent diplomacy which has largely consisted of bullying and their wolf warriors has had a negative impact most places. So a significant decline in their popularity. I think all the evidence shows that. So all those things seem correct. But I think when you get to the bottom lines, uh, I still strongly disagree. And so I, I start first to try to just say, we should look at the facts. So let me advertise a study that we've just released at Belfer. Uh, we've released two of the five chapters. The first one was on the great technology rivalry. And the second one just yesterday on the great military rivalry. And the third one is on the great economic rivalry. And the fourth one is on the great diplomacy rivalry. And the fifth one is on the systems rivalry or between democracy and autocracy. So just briefly, if you look, what, what, the, what the study did was respond to an assignment that asked what, just compare for us the facts, uh, the year 2000, and then documenting year by year to where we stand today in 2020. So snapshot 2000, snapshot 2020, and the evidence about what happened in between. And you can't look at this without being genuinely shocked. Even, I mean, I study, I watch this problem all the time. But when I look at it, I think, no, no, it cannot be that China is a serious competitor of the US in quantum. How could that be? That couldn't be. To which answer is, excuse me, it is. Well, China could not be ahead of the US 
in some applications of AI. Well, if you look at the technology rivalry chapter, you'll see that China is clearly ahead of the US in facial recognition, in voice recognition, in integrated surveillance, even in FinTech, despite the recent uh, disruption at Ant. So what, this, what these studies show, and I think what the evidence shows, is that in 2020, a nation that we could hardly find in our rearview mirror, we cannot find in our rearview mirror today because it's beside us or sometimes even right on our heels or slightly ahead of us. So if you think about the Olympics, basically if this were a series of Olympic contests, a nation that was in the distant past, distant in, the, in, the, in, in our back distance in the back in the rearview mirror is now beside us or even slightly ahead of us. So with respect to the military, look at the military balance over Taiwan. David, I'm sure is familiar with this. In 1996, Clinton felt very comfortable, the Pentagon very comfortable in recommending, send two carriers up and force China to back down. As, uh, as Davidson testified, if that were the scenario today, you would not send two carriers into that area because they would be at risk of being sunk. So the military balance in the regional has changed significantly. If you look at the uh, technology rivalry, a country that was, as I say, distant past is now, as we say, a full spectrum peer competitor. One of the most interesting areas that I've tried to drill down, one is AI. And Eric Schmidt has been my co-author there, the fellow who had been the chief executive of Google when they got deep into AI. As he says, in the year 2000, you couldn't see China. It was back with Europe, not really a competitor. Today in the AI space, Google sees China as a serious peer competitor. If I do economics, in the year 2000, you had a poor developing country just getting entry into the WTO. And the US was the number one trading partner of everybody. Today, you have an economy that's as big as the US, depending on whether you use MER or PPP, but certainly in the range of, and it was the dominant trading partner of everybody. And then who was the world's manufacturing workshop? We were. Who is the world's manufacturing workshop today? So we go through the, and in the diplomacy arena, just as you say, fortunately, even though for Americans, as Bill Burns puts it in his memoir, diplomacy is a lost art, and unfortunately, I'm afraid it is, the good news is at least it hasn't been found in Beijing. <laughs> so their ugly bullying is not being successful. So just to the bottom line, has China today the ability to impact the behavior of South Korea and Japan and the US, not necessarily whether they like them, but how they behave. The answer is it does. Will it continue to do that in 2027? I think, unfortunately, yes, it will. I don't think that's deniable. Can we, could we imagine a sustainable US strategy for doing a better job of balancing this seesaw so that we have a favorable correlation of forces for our interests and values. Yes, we could, but will we do it? That's the big question. So maybe we should go there before we're done, Bonnie. But my view is that yes, they have a sphere of influence today. Yes, they will have a sphere of influence in 2027. And what we're arguing about is how significant that will be and which of our interests and which of our values it will impact. Thank you, Professor Allison. Uh, many questions hopefully that we can get to during the Q&A too. But let me turn first to Dave General Stilwell for your initial rebuttal. Third stuff to argue with your points, um, you know, all uh, very well argued and um, backed up. Um, I guess I would say, just in general, I would quote Churchill here and say, America will always do the right thing after it's tried everything else. We've tried everything else. Okay. All the things that you pointed out um, uh, were us helping. I gave a speech at CSIS in December 2019 on this, you know, running through 40 years of us actually helping 
trying to become our biggest competitor. And we did it with a full heart. And I think for all the right reasons that make, again, our worldview attractive. Um, all the numbers you quote are exactly accurate, but they don't forecast uh, what happens in five years. And if you look at the curves, if you look at those trends on trade and manufacturing, they are starting to bend. And so my point is that in five years, they will have bent. I think we've reached peak China, which is why they're bending. If you look at what COVID has done to China, not only a massive uh, blast to any uh, credibility it has, you know, after arresting a doctor who simply notified, noted that we have a problem here and then uh, not allowing anybody in for investigation and all those things. And then the subsequent shutdowns that have made doing business in China even more difficult. And if you look at what businesses are doing, they are leaving China. It's not a wholesale route yet, but it is no longer attractive. Demographics, labor costs are too expensive now. Um, uh, regulation is increasing and it's tougher to do business. And then with the, the Michaels, Peng Shui and all these others, it's just dangerous living in China. If you look at the national security law, it says, if you say or do or anything on your computer, something that uh, offends the communist party uh, or undermines its national security, uh, you are therefore subject to not just arrest inside China, but arrest outside too. So it's extraterritorial. It, uh, these things are all having uh, an effect. Uh, yes, they are. They have a definite uh, growing trend in tech. I mentioned Dr. Charles Libra, and there are others uh, through their Thousand Talents program where they've in, infiltrated our universities and academia and our research uh, facilities. Uh, if we continue to shut that tap off, which we have done by uh, eliminating Confucius Institutes, uh, if, you know, in my world, closing Houston Consulate, which was uh, doing just uh, terrible things to both the uh, academic and um, MD Anderson Medical Center. Uh, they were at, in their wholesale stealing. What happens to this magnificent R&D capability in China when they can no longer borrow or steal uh, all the knowledge that's out here and available? That door is closing. And um, it will continue to close, I believe. And by 2027, it will be entirely indigenous development. And the Chinese people are just as creative and capable, but they're in a government that doesn't allow free thought and creative thought because it's dangerous. And we've seen that as well. Um, and I guess uh, the last thing is, uh, yes, you're right. Military, it is hard to make the argument that they've peaked. Um, but I gotta say that uh, and my understanding of the PLA and of the CCP is they do not have great confidence in um, their military capability. Uh, there's another great book here on Deng Xiaoping's long war, the invasion of uh, Vietnam in 1979, and, and the great doubts they had about the, the loyalty and the capability of the PLA, those doubts remain. Uh, and so the Taiwan option still, I believe, remains very distant. There'll be a lot of posturing. And there will be a lot of empty threats. What we need to do is acknowledge that they're empty, acknowledge the complete lack of credibility, and do what we do uh, and, and stay true to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So now let's move to the Q&A portion. I see a number of folks have already figured out how to submit questions. Uh, you basically type in the question to the chat function, and then we'll see it from our end. So as we're waiting for questions to pop up, I did want to touch on a topic that was mentioned briefly uh, by both of our distinguished uh, debaters, which is uh, Russia. Uh, so I want to ask about, as we think about China's ambitions and its influence in the Indo-Pacific, to what extent do you see China-Russia relations as either strengthening or weakening China's sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific between now and 2027? So maybe let's let me turn to Professor Allison first and then to Dave. So Bonnie, thank you very much. Good question. I wrote a piece in 2019, was the cover story of the national interests, basically taking, so answering, arguing that the relationship between Russia and China, and particularly the relationship between Xi and Putin was stronger and more significant than US alliances with many of our most precious allies. And then to make it pointed, since my colleague Bob Blackwell uh, had been ambassador to India, was much more consequential than the relationship between the US and India. So the 
the the the peg for the piece uh, i hadn't actually meant to do it but they the magazine got after me and asked me to go look into it and so i tried to find a framework for comparing the strengths and significance of allies and aligned and i i couldn't find any framework so we invented a poor man's version of it but basically if you if you look at it, Spig Brzezinski had the insight back in 2017, just before he died. He said, what the Americans are doing is creating, he quote, an alliance of the aggrieved. That we couldn't have designed a better policy for pushing two unnatural parties into an alignment or an alliance. And I think that basically is a right insight. I give the reasons why. First, brilliant diplomacy by Xi Jinping. He immediately figured out Russia was going to matter to him and he could deal with Putin. So they now call themselves best buddies. And when they have conversations like the one they had just yesterday or the day before, what is the first topic they always talk about? How the Americans are trying to undermine our governments and specifically our regimes and our leadership. And are they correct about that? Well, to some extent, yes. We don't like their autocracies and the way they behave. Secondly, if you look at the compare, their, their sharing of military intelligence and of their military and sales of military arms and even military exercises, again, compare it with US and India, more significant. So I go on down a, a checklist. I think, unfortunately, this is a, it is an unnatural. Uh, uh, Mattis would always say they can't possibly be related to, you know, have a, have a healthy or have a working relationship. Because if you were living next door to China, if you think we're concerned about China's rise, what about Russia with a a half of its territory essentially unpopulated and full of resources on this abutting a border that's full of people and no resources. So it's very hard to make these two countries work so effectively together, but the combination of Xi's brilliance and our clumsiness, I think has done so. Thank you, uh, General Stilwell. Um, I'll just give an example uh, of why it's not working. It's the friendship bridge that they built uh, over the, I think, the Usuri River, uh, connecting Heilongjiang uh, to uh, the Soviet far other Siberia. Chinese built this beautiful bridge. The Russians never built the uh, the approach to it, and so the bridge that doesn't work. I think that may have been remedied since, but this is a demonstration of just how uh, little love is lost. Um, the city of Vladivostok, the original, the, the Chinese name of it is Haishenwai. Right, sea cucumber cliffs. If you talk to Chinese netizens, when they hear the the term, uh, when when the government says um, not one inch of uh, sovereign territory bequeathed to us by our ancestors, they ask the first one of the first questions they ask is, "What about Vladivostok or Hai Uh There is this sense of uh, aggrievement there as well, and and it's an interesting question I think, and it's a really great question that uh, Nadia. Uh, uh, Nadej Rolan uh, addressed in her book on Central Asia, is you have the traditional Russian spheres of influence in Central Asia, and it's being impeded, imposed on and intruded on by the Belt and Road. So you've got uh, Chinese belt, uh, pipelines and roads and rail going right through um, Central Asia uh, to get access to Eurasia into, uh, and Europe. Um, and, and there's definitely hard feelings about that, not just in the countries themselves, but in Moscow. And so, uh, and, and finally, look how much the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has produced. I mean, what? It, it, India, it has members of India and Pakistan. Um, it, it, it's a bumper sticker without any real capability. It could be. And the concern is that that thing actually were to uh, become effective, it could possibly create problems. But again, with India involved, it, it, I can't see that happening. Uh, I got to point to the history. Um, you know, they fought an act of war in 1969, and, and before that, it doesn't seem like it's going to be easy to paper over those differences. His point is, Dr. Allison's point is correct. Uh, there is U.S. actions and, and U.S. defending itself, you know, globally is creating a an unnatural relationship, but it really is unnatural and it's not going to last. Thank you. 
So uh, I have a, actually a couple of questions from the audience for General Stillwell. A number of folks wanted to see your, the book that you were uh, highlighting first. If you could just, um, because we couldn't see the, the author of the book. So it's Political Warfare by, who's Carrie, the author? Carrie Gershanik. Okay, great. And then along the lines, one of the um, questions from the audience I thought was quite insightful. Um, the question is saying that Dr. Allison is talking about hard power and General Stillwell is talking about soft power. Uh, basically, your arguments aren't too contradictory from this audience member. And his question is, will the threat of a rising China push China's neighbors um, away, and will they be intimidated and subjected to China's strength? So General Still, I want I wanted to turn, first turn this question to you and then over to uh, Professor Allison. Another reason I, I showed this book, uh, you know, they're fighting Vietnam. The history there is also instructive. Um, if you go to Vietnam, uh, and if you go to Hanoi, there's a, a war museum there. And, and as you walk in the first building, it's got, I think, 27 busts of great uh, Vietnamese generals. I'm going, oh boy, here we go, Vietnam War. Two of those generals fought the US and the French. The other 25 fought the Chinese invasion of 1000, the Chinese invasion of 1120, the Chinese invasion like that. There is no love lost uh, among Chinese 14 neighbors of which they fought wars with 12. And they're fighting now India today. Um, you know, when you're a great power like that, when you're a big power, you just you naturally create antibodies. Um, and especially when you're using hard power and not soft power um, through uh, pressure, invasions, influence, and, and those things. Or, you know, um, influence as in violating China's policy of bu gan shi nei jiang, right? Non-interference in internal affairs of other countries very cynically do the exact opposite. Um, I, I, I think it's a very easy... Uh, beyond the economic draw, it doesn't take much to explain and, and argue that China's neighbors are not real happy with being aligned. Even Pakistan, it's lips and teeth ally, so. Thank you. Uh, Professor Allison? Well, look, again, I think I mainly agree with, uh, with David here. I think that it's fascinating the relationship between China and Vietnam. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the you know, Kissinger show and lie conversations. And for those that have never read the transcript, those are now, they had been previously highly classified, but they're available and they're fascinating. So obviously Kissinger is mainly looking for help uh, for getting the US out of Vietnam. Uh, this is 1971, just 50 years ago. And uh, 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 Show and Lai and Mao are mainly interested in Taiwan. And that's where you ultimately come out. But uh, uh, Show and Lai says the Kissinger says, you know, we actually know a lot about Vietnam. Uh, and that comes up. And Henry says, well, what about that? He says, you know, actually, we were defeated by Vietnam by two uh, uh, women, women, gener women generals. And Kissinger hadn't didn't know the history. He said, what? And he said, yeah, he said, actually, I went and laid, and Show and Lai said, I went and laid flowers at the graves of those generals. So there's certainly no love loss in Vietnam for, for uh, China. One of the senior leaders once said to a colleague of mine, he said, have you ever looked at the map of Vietnam? And I said, no, I look at it. He says, it looks a little bit like a backbone, but it's kind of deformed. He said, that's us. And it's deformed because China has been sitting on our back for 4,000 years. So I think China has left something to be desired in its relations with its neighbors. But before we get too uh, uh, hyperbolic about this, it's worth remembering uh, the US behavior towards our neighbors and uh, how they actually may think about that. So nobody in Mexico who's a strategic thinker forgets that big chunks of a country are now called New Mexico. <laughs> Maybe that'll give you a hint or Texas, some portions or California. Uh, in my book, Destined for War, I have a chapter on what if Xi Jinping were just like us, which is one that Americans the, like the least of this one, but it compares American behavior at the beginning of the 20th century, when we were entering what we were sure was going to be an American century, under the leadership of one of my heroes, Teddy Roosevelt. 
and the way we behave. And if you look at it, I think if Teddy Roosevelt and Xi Jinping were having a conversation, Teddy would say, you know, you seem to me pretty tame, pretty reserved as compared. Uh, I won't take you through all of the chapter and verse only to say that if you go look to see how did the US acquire the biggest uh, forest in our national forest system, which is the Songus National Forest in the fat tail of Alaska. I've been there fishing, it's absolutely wonderful. We basically stole it from Canada, fair and square. If you go to the Canadian uh, National Museum, they have a great display about this. I'm glad we did. Uh, we can fish in the territory and it's now ours, but uh, I think that's not forgotten by Canadian strategists. Fortunately, if you're living with weak neighbors who need you more than they do, they can learn to live with things that are fairly uncomfortable. And even most of the time, forget about them. Thank you. So Professor Allison, another question for you. Actually, a couple of questions I'll roll up into one. Uh, so you mentioned um, China's significant growth from 2000 until 2020 and the range of studies that you look at here. From your perspective, what are what do you see as some of the major weaknesses in China's development now or up till 2027? A particular question relates to if you think, for example, China's financial system uh, and, uh, and whether China suffers from potential major economic vulnerability from that. It's a great question. You, know, you can uh, find serious analysts who argue that China has peaked. Uh, David mentioned that. Uh, uh, and who argue that the weaknesses in China's economy are now coming home to roost. And there's 10 favorite ones. And you can find equally serious analysts who argue that yes, China has huge obstacles, but it's demonstrated in the past that it can overcome them and it will do so in the future. Actually, at the conclusion of this chapter that I mentioned of our great rivalry on the economic rivalry, the conclusion of it is asks the question, will China continue over the next decade growing at more than twice the rate of the US, since it's the relative position of the two parties that matter. And it says, here's the arguments for no, and here's the arguments for yes. So in the no column, you start with debt and the real estate bubble that has been recently lanced over Evergrande, uh, though if you watch the way to jump to the yes column, the Chinese government has handled that. It's been much more effectively than the US handling of the crisis we faced after Lehman. And without a great financial crisis and without the risk of a great recession. So there's demographics, David mentioned that. The, the demographics is a serious problem created by a crazy one child policy that's now relaxed. Over time, that will adjust. Well, will that affect next the workforce? Well, the workforce will be shrunk as the demographics shrink, but the retirement age in China today is 60. So it's not very hard to adjust that to the American level of 65 and therefore normalize your workforce as required. Plus there's this additional 500 million people they're trying to get out of the countryside into the cities. So that's another huge undertaking, but in terms of, of your workforce. So you can work your way down this list. My bet is that uh, if I had to bet, I mean, I would say, oh my goodness. I, but if you look at the people who make their living betting, does Elon Musk think that his EVs are going to be produced more and sold more in China or in the US? China. They've just opened this big new factory. Does Apple, the world's most valuable company, produce its iPhones in the US or somewhere else? I mean, in China or somewhere else? In China. So that's where iPhones are assembled. Does the world's biggest manager uh, of money, BlackRock, uh, has it doubled down or has it reduced its exposure to China? It's doubled down. Does the world's largest uh, 
foreign investor, UBS, what they're voting about China. They've doubled down. So I think the if I follow the smartest companies and the smartest investors, they may turn out to be wrong, but they're betting that China will continue at a slower growth rate than it's seen in the past, but at more than twice the rate of the US. And since for me, it's the geopolitics that's the, <laughs> that I care about more than the economics, the economics is the wherewithal for that. Uh, I would like to take comfort in the fact that they had, that the trends had, had, uh, had turned and they had peaked, but I'm not going to count on it. Yeah. Thank you. Let me um, now make sure Thanks. that we do ask the, the question that um, Professor Allison actually asked at the beginning and turn that question to uh, General Stilwell, which is um, one of the questions that you raised, uh, Professor Allison, was what are the main or major ways that, China, that if, or, uh, as we look forward, China's sphere of influence will challenge U.S. interests? So I'd like to turn that question to General Stilwell, and maybe we can then wrap up quickly, um, and I'll give a little bit of time for both speakers to also address the question that Professor Allison, you asked, uh, asked early on, which is what should the United States do very briefly as the last question after that. So General Stilwell, to you first on um, ways in which China's spheres influence challenge US interests and then any thoughts that you have for what the United States should do. Um, good, let me just answer, uh, make one very important point here. Um, there were a lot of stats quoted about business opportunities in China. You can't believe any because you can't verify them. The official death rate from COVID in China today is still 4,686. It has been that since last April. That is the official death toll. There is no stat I can think of that's more definite than someone's alive or dead. And we know it's much, much bigger than that. But uh, legitimacy hinges on this. And now they've told this lie and they can't back down from it. Uh, and then on Tesla, uh, Tesla is being pushed out of China. And, and all that technology is going to a Chinese company called NIO. Um, Apple iPhones, you're seeing Tim Cook, um, there's a story that he paid $250 billion to maintain access to Apple iPhones in China. These things are not sustainable and, and uh, we need to continue to try to verify um, these things. I th again, it, it, if my theory is correct and we've seen peak power, uh, China's um, Beijing, not China, remember it's the Communist Party, not the people, um, but their actions will become more dire and desperate. Uh, and so it's gonna become more overt and it's gonna become easier to, to uh, identify, but we have to have the will to identify and then to deal with it. And this involves Department of Justice, FBI, and, and look, rule of law matters in this country. This is why we have an attractive uh, philosophy is we dismiss cases unless we have you know, strong evidence, strong proof, that, uh, convincing proof. Uh, unlike kangaroo courts in China uh, today, and, and you're seeing you know, in Hong Kong, whereas um, judicial independence was the one thing that gave Hong Kong some semblance of autonomy, you're, you're seeing even that whittled and, and you can't even speak of it judicial independence inside China. I mean, did the Michaels get any uh, due process? Uh, and how can you do business in a country? This is what Hong Kong's utility was, was uh, it had the legal framework that would at least give uh, foreign businesses opportunity inside China to take them to task. So my, my point is the challenges will become more overt, but I don't think they can afford to be more overt in the military sphere because you end up with power balancing and it won't be just Japan. I mean, the Australians said, if there's a conflict, it would be conceivable that Australia not be in, would not be involved. India is joining in, in uh, exercises in the Indian Ocean in the South China Sea. And so it, it's, a, it's a push pull, it's a Newtonian. Each action creates a uh, reaction. And if these, re if these are not the type of actions that people can understand and buy into, uh, it's going to create even greater uh, power balancing and uh, re uh, reactions. Thank you. That's so before my, we go, that's my concluding statement. Thank you. So before we uh, go back to both speakers for your uh, last words on what the United States should do with our allies and partners, I did want to activate the poll so folks can uh, do the final debate poll as we're listening to our speakers wrap up their um, their thoughts on this topic. So I've just activated the poll and I'll close the poll after we um, turn to Professor Allison and again, General Stowell for any last comments on um, very briefly, what you think, what is the top thing that you think the United States should do with our allies and partners as we think about China's sphere of influence? So uh, General, so, sorry, Professor Allison, over to you. Okay, so let me make just one brief comment on uh, 
on David's point, and then uh, I'll answer your question. I think, I think the uh, uh, one needs to look very carefully at uh, what actually businesses are doing in China and what they know about it. So if you ask the folks at Starbucks, they know how many lattes they sold. If you ask the people at Kentucky Fried Chicken, they know how much chicken they're selling. If you ask Tesla, how many cars have they sold in China this year? Answer 416,000. So do they have good data? You bet, that's their business. And I think if you look at the financial companies as they've been investing, again, their information system gets beneath the government system and way better than what you would read in the newspapers. So I would say, don't discount China's economic growth as, and the judgments about it as reflected by people who are betting their money uh, and big money. Uh, they may be wrong, but it's clear they're not doing this as a matter of emotion or otherwise. In terms of what to do, I think the objective for the US that I think the Biden administration has appreciated is that China's power is rising and will continue to rise. So I compare this in my book to a seesaw, as if there were kids sitting on either end of a, of a seesaw on a playground. And if the party on the other side of the seesaw is bulking up so that my feet are lifting off the ground, I either have to eat a lot, and that's hard to do, or I have to get some other parties with weight to sit on my side of the seesaw. And David mentioned, actually, we've been doing this to some extent with some success. And China, as it's been bullying people, is actually helping us. So to the extent that Japan makes a clearer choice to be aligned with us in the quad and even begins to think about planning for those purposes, that's weight and it counts on this side. The AUKUS, to the extent that Australia is making a long-term bet on the US military relationship for their submarines, this is somebody sitting on our side of the seesaw. That matters. To the extent that India, if it should ever end up playing any operational role that would be useful, I remain skeptical, hopeful, but skeptical. But if it were to do, Vietnam, I'm, I'm not again, thinking these need to simply be democracies. To the extent that Vietnam's interests align with our interests, that's called good. And to the, in my view, since it's the geopolitics that interests or that I think most impact our, our interests. So finding ways to create a web of allied and aligned who have weight, not ones that come with more liabilities than than strength that they bring to the party. We need strength. And we'll recognize that, of course, their difference, their interests will not be the same as our interests. There'll be lots of complexities. It won't be some one, one alliance. They're not going to be a NATO and an uh, economic iron curtain. And it's even going to be so much more complicated because China will remain the dominant economic power in terms of the relationship with most of these parties, even while we're trying to get them in our, our side of the seesaw for security purposes. So the reason why I think this is the most formidable challenge any American government has ever faced is we're facing a country that's become as big and strong as we are, at risk at likely becoming bigger and stronger in some dimensions, and that it's not an isolated country, it's a country that has understood that geoeconomics matter as much as geopolitics and that economic relationships and the power that that gives almost matters as much as the hard power of military. And so have become a second backbone of the global economy and one from which these other countries are not gonna decouple. So I, I think that's the challenge going forward to try to build a correlation of forces that'll be favorable to our interests and values. And that only being possible by some artful web of allied and aligned. Thank you, Professor Allison. Really excellent final remarks. Uh, General Stilwell, over to you for your final comments or thoughts. Yeah, the, the, the argument is black and white and it reminds me of Deng Xiaoping's, you know, it matters not whether a cat is black or white so long as it catches mice. So I think the, 
Uh, I, I learned a lot in the process. And of course, it's neither black or white here. And I did learn a lot from uh, Professor Allison's paper uh, from last, last spring on uh, new spheres of influence sharing the globe with other great powers. I commend it to those who are watching. Uh, Professor Allison, you, you again, I, educated me through this process. You continue to be a great educator. And I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I'm going to use your seesaw analogy for my final uh, closure. Words matter. Again, an ex-military guy, look at those airplanes up there. I, I never used to think words were that great. Words absolutely matter. Uh, and the words I'm going to point to here are the continual uh, um, trope coming out of Beijing that says, you just need to meet us halfway. And what that says is, in the seesaw analogy, is if this is stasis, if this is pure fairness, uh, that the relationship is heavily skewed in the U.S.'s favor, and that the U.S. needs to be reasonable and just meet China halfway to get this relationship back where it belongs. Now, we all know the relationship, as we showed by uh, uh, identifying the excesses their diplomats uh, are doing in our own country, their media that claim to be doing news or, in fact, doing uh, propaganda and even worse. We know that it's skewed grossly in their favor now. And what China is saying is we want even more in our favor. We are going to win without fighting by simply making appealing to your sense of fairness uh, and, and getting you to give in and give just a little bit more. It's a beautiful strategy. It's admirable. Uh, but the time of, of wishing it away is over, as, as, uh, as uh, Professor Allison made very clear in the military sphere and the economic sphere and others, that we, we need to gird up and we need to remember uh, what great power competition is about and get busy. And I think once we're in the comp competition mode, fully engaged, there's no question how this is going to turn out. Thank you. Thank you, General Stilwell. I'm going to end the poll right now and share the results. Um, the results are actually remarkably similar to where we started with. Um, and I think actually both speakers agree to some extent that China already has a sphere of influence. It's just a matter of whether that's going to be increasing or decreasing as we move to 2027. Uh, so let me close here by thanking both of our excellent uh, panelists and debaters for joining us today. And I want to note that this is the, our last and final debate of our China Power Conference. And um, we will be wrapping up our work for this year, and we hope that you will be able to join us next year. And last but not um, but perhaps quite important is that um, we hope that everyone will have a happy uh, holidays, and we hope that you will join us again in the new year as we have a number of events um, at podcasts al um, uh, aligned for the next year. So thank you again, and Happy holidays.